If you feel your colleagues are out to get you, it turns out that you could be right. A study of office politics suggests that workplaces are a jungle of awkward personalities vying for domination. Now, my next guest is a psychologist, a best-selling author and broadcaster, and he's identified three types of dysfunctional personalities among white-collar workers. There's the psychopath, there's the Machiavellian, and there's the narcissist. Oliver James, good morning. Good morning. Now, tell us a little bit about the, the, those three types of personalities. I mean, I always think of psychopaths as people who might stick a knife in your back, literally rather than metaphorically. Well, indeed, yes. And in the UK, about 40,000 people are in prison and are categorised as psychopathic. But in fact, 1% of the population are psychopathic. So if you think about that in the UK, there are about 60 million people. That's 600,000 psychopaths, of whom only 40,000 are in prison. <laughs> so there's an awful lot of psychopaths that always have been wandering around. Uh, people, you know, obviously some of them are killers like Patricia Highsmith's Ripley character. But most of them are you know, uh, more or less able to stay within the law so they don't end up in prison. And then so long as they can conceal their obnoxious traits, they can get to the top. The average is 1% of the general population. The average amongst senior managers, a very good study showed in America of American senior managers, 4% are psychopathic. Mm. Uh, the key new evidence shows that if you have the cold, ruthless, unempathic traits of psychopathy, you are also likely to be highly Machiavellian, a game-playing, moving people around on the chessboard type person, compulsive game player, only happy if you feel there's some kind of plot going on. And if you're a narcissist, which means a me, 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 grandiose, self-focused, selfish person. Now, narcissists, Machiavels and psychopaths are termed the dark triad. And in the office, if somebody is making your life hell, they're very likely to be triadic in this way. And great, as I say, there is evidence that in all three categories, you are more likely to be a senior manager if you are triadic. Mm. Now, can you give us some examples of people who would uh, fit into each individual category and then perhaps an example of a triadic person uh, without libeling anyone, at least without libeling anyone living? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, there are, of course, plenty of favorite. You know, if you, if you think, if you want well, the psychopath, think Gordon Gecko from Wall Street. But th there's the example of an extremely unpleasant guy who works in film production who I call Rat. Uh, who spends his whole day long trying to stitch everybody else up, trying to take credit where it's not due and uh, trying to put the blame for his mistakes onto other people. The classic psychopath you know, in management is somebody who manages to conceal that ruthlessness, who, who managed to give a certain glib charm. Uh, he's, remember, he's also a Machiavelli, so he's good at game playing. He's also a narcissist, uh, but he, he, he conceals all these traits sufficiently that the obnoxiousness of him, of him uh, you know, is, is not as important as, as, as the fact that he's stitching everybody else and getting his way and getting the boss on his side, uh, getting the pay and the promotion that everybody else should mm. be getting. Um, the Machiavellian character, we, we all know by now that um, Machiavelli gets a bad name. Um, when he wrote, wrote the book The Prince, um, it wasn't about the, the modern dark arts. It was quite a realistic book about how one might behave to achieve certain ends. Well, that's a good point, Pat. You see, and I think that the, the actually what I'm trying to do in this book is to explain that there is nothing whatever wrong with office politics. Office politics have got a bad name, but actually we all engage in them, whether we like it or not. And I want people to try and face that fact that they, you know, one in five communications in offices are lies or untruths, at least half truths. Uh, we'd conceal the truth. We must do because resources are limited, pay and promotion are limited. And all of us are quite understandably trying to get the best for ourselves. And there is nothing wrong with doing that. So in the book, what I'm trying to do is to plead with people that, you know, there's so many, we all know, very talented people who don't get nearly as far as they should because... Um, they don't play the game. They don't play the game, and you have to play the game. And people take a sort of get on their high horse and take a sort of morals, moral position and say, oh, I, I'm not going to sink to that kind of thing. Well, actually, we all do. There's nobody who doesn't at some point when the phone rings at home 
tell the child to say, no, I'm not in. You know, so we teach our children to lie. We lie. Of course we do. I'm not, but I'm not arguing that we should all become psychopathic Machiavellian narcissists. I'm just saying that what we need is to develop and hone our office political skills in order to do good. You know, Bob Geldof did not arrange live aid without having good office political skills. Now, talk about the, the people that we might recognise as being Machiavellian and uh, the personalities we might see as narcissistic. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the famous Machiavels would be the likes of Peter Mandelson in this country, for example, is, you know, always famously cited. Uh, Alistair Campbell, pretty well the whole of the new Labour government were extremely Machiavellian. I don't know if you see the thick of it over there in, in Ireland, but there's a, a very amusing comedy series like Yes Minister about, about mm -hmm. pe people in politics. Pretty well anybody who gets near the top has to be good at Machiavellian, Machiavellianism. You have to be able to play the game and you have to be able to read other people. You know, the essence of office politics, as it's defined in mo the modern literature, which shows, incidentally, that your skill at office politics is a better predictor of who's going to succeed than your measure on IQ tests or personality tests. And the definition of office, office politics is astuteness, being able to read others yourself in the organisation. Effectiveness, putting that astuteness to, into practice with the right strategies used at the right moment with the right person, and then networking and sincerity, the appearance of sincerity. <laughs> you don't have to actually be sincere, but you must at least seem sincere. And if you put those four things together, astuteness, effectiveness, uh, networking, and sincerity, um, that, that's what all of us need to hone our skills. Mm. So when you go in to get a pay rise from your boss, you need to play the game. You need to pretend to like the boss, however much you hate him. What about the narcissist then? Uh, is the he narcissist, invariably a footballer or a, a yeah, showbiz? I mean, I mean, the most famous narcissist that, that probably you've all heard of, which, which I, I know it's, it's possible for me to say this because I said it many times before, is, is, is Stephen Fry. Is somebody who's very self-focused. I know Stephen. I interviewed him. He's... Uh, you know, I'm not uh, uh, trying to be nasty to him. I know he has many, many difficulties in his life. But his greatest difficulty, I think, is the extent to which he is self-obsessed. And he's a classic example of somebody who's enormously successful, but is, in the end, in, you know, obsessed with himself. And those people, of course, are the least difficult to deal with if you have one as a boss, because the, the strategy of ingratiation... Uh, which I have a chapter on, which involves things like flattery and chameleonism, works a treat with the narcissists because yeah. they cannot get enough flattery. Of course, um, it has to be done subtly and cleverly at the right moment. And what, what about Twitter? I mean, um, people who use Twitter extensively in the belief that the world should be interested in their views on just about anything, does that show narcissism? Well, indeed, and Stephen Fry is, of course, a fine example of that, has a huge number of followers because he is a very amusing chap. Uh, although he's very boring to speak to, I can tell you, I've spent plenty of time sitting talking to him and he's actually incredibly, like all narcissists, they're incredibly dull because they're not interested in anything you're saying. They're just interested in proving how much cleverer they are than you. But yes, Twitter, when it first started, I was asked for a quote about it and I said, you know, I think this is a really terrible sign of where we're up to. It, you know, it shows how lonely these people are who are twittering and how lonely the people are who are following it why on earth do you want to hear the latest thoughts of some famous person because they just had lunch or they've just been to the loo it really is extraordinary mm -hmm. that twitter exists in my opinion and of course it has been turned into a commercial thing now but in the end when it when it first came out i did say this is a sad sign of how lonely we will become your own anecdotal evidence of working in television, you describe it as by far the most triadic environment you've ever encountered, full of psychopaths and, of course, the odd Machiavellian and narcissist thrown in. Well, it's the perfect example. You know, the fun one, one of the fundamental reasons why the triadic have thrived so much and why office politics has become so much more vital in our lives is because the great majority of us work in service industries. Only 11% of people in the UK are in manufacturing now. Time was when you produced 100 widgets or dolls a day and you got paid a certain amount per doll and it was all transparent. Now it's very unclear what the contribution of a person has been to an organisation's profits or, or public sector success. 
uh, you know, whether you work in the health service, education service, or, or in the private sector. Uh, and as a result of that, how your performance is evaluated, the metric that's used to measure it, uh, is really difficult for it to be objective. Uh, with with a with a widget, you either did or didn't produce it. Mm. With, uh, with a, your job as a PR person or working in insurance or whatever it is, it's really hard to say. And it's out of that that you get. Uh, this huge rise in the amount of triadic behaviour and the television industry is the perfect yeah. illustration. I worked in it for 20 years and what's fascinating about it is the number of triadic people in it. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Uh, if you're not triadic when you start, if you don't become triadic, you haven't got a chance. Uh, you say television is jam-packed with untalented people who've managed to associate themselves with successful programmes and dissociate themselves from failures. That's right. And I mean, I had, you know, one of my closest friends became a very senior television person. And it was a rare example of somebody who isn't triadic in that industry. Uh, but I worked with many people who uh, were extremely devious, uh, who stitched me up. Uh, I was not particularly good at office politics at that point. I wouldn't claim to be a, a genius at it today. But uh, I really had to get you know, get my skates on and, and learn how to cope with these people because you had to start from the assumption that what everybody was saying to you was a lie. It's an it's a Alice in Wonderland world, the world of television production. And it, it's because it's very hard to judge if a programme's good or bad, why that happened. So it may be that the research erected, it may be the producer erected, maybe the director erected. Uh, there are so many people involved in the production of it, and it's really hard to pin down if something, mm -hmm. why something is either you, good or bad. You talk and, about the, the metric in television. Well, it tends to be the ratings. Um, if you get good ratings, the programme de facto is good. If you get lousy ratings, the programme de facto is bad. However, um, maybe the kind of program you're doing, a symphony concert, for example, from uh, some distant location, um, it pleases all of the people who want to watch that kind of thing. Uh, equally, uh, a dumbed-down uh, game show might be just the sort of uh, opiate that a lot of people will let wash over them. Well, I mean, it's certainly true that... that there is a final metric in terms of viewing figures, but the difficulty is in working out, for example, if if uh, Britain's Got Talent has a bad season, is that the fault of the producer? It's not easy to say. It could be the executive producer. It could be the commissioning editor. It could the be the scheduler putting it up against it Dancing on Ice or whatever, is, you know. That's right. There are so many factors involved, and it's exactly the same in the financial, in, financial services industry. I, I have a, a chapter on acting, which is, as I say, very, very important. Performance. There is no magic box of tricks. People think of office politics, oh, if I could only learn a few more tricks. It's not quite as simple as that. You do need to know the tricks, but you also need to be very astute and you need to be able to perform and in the chapter on acting I describe a guy who was work, worked as a broker for five years and he, he put on the most amazing performance I mean he's an amazing guy, he's a fascinating individual uh, he's not triadic, he's a very decent person and after five years he couldn't stand it anymore because he was having to be so false all the time but he was a brilliant actor and it, it is a very uh, you know, important uh, illustrative example because it shows how all of us need to be more deliberate and more conscious about when we're acting and when we're not acting. Just as we muddle up so much the private and the personal now, we're not, we say we have our friends, but we don't really know increasingly who our friends are or whether we're going out for a drink with them because we hope they'll promote us. Um, so uh, he, he, this guy went right in there. He put on an act. Uh, he pretended to know a whole lot of things he didn't know. He, he blinded them with sort of pseudo maths about a certain financial instrument, and he got away with an enormous amount. Uh, but now, you know, of course, he couldn't. You know, my my basic argument in the book is that you need actually to be emotionally healthy. I have a, a definition of emotional health. Mm -hmm. uh, what what I mean by that, uh, living the first hand. Uh, living in the present, um, you know, not being jammed on transmit, you know, or on receive, you know, two-way communication, uh, insightful, not, you know, anticipating that you're about to make a mistake, being playful rather than game playing, being vivacious rather than hyperactive, and being authentic rather than sincere, those six things. Now, you can be emotionally healthy, and as part, a big part of that is office politics. In order to actualise yourself, in order to express yourself, to achieve the things you want to do, to do good, let's hope that you want to do good for other people as well as for yourself, because that, in the end, is what produces 
fulfillment in your life. Uh, in order to achieve that, you do need to have office political skills. So I'm pleading with everybody to, to look closely. And I've been told, very enough people have been kind enough to say to me, if you read the second half of the book, it will help you to deal with the triadic people at work. It will help you to become a more effective performer at work. And hopefully you will, out of that, you will put yourself to the, you know, actually to the service of your company, of your public sector job or whatever it is. And actually, you know, be a nicer person when you get home. Uh, be better uh, partner to your uh, your parents. Uh, you know the whole thing is is is, is it, it is actually a, a, a very virtuous circle if you become better at office politics. Believe it or not. Well, the book is called Office Politics: How to Thrive in a World of Lying, Backstabbing, and Dirty Tricks. Published by Ebury Publishing, priced at twenty pounds sterling, something more in euro here. And its author Oliver James. Thank you very much for joining us on the program.